Hey, welcome to the Holy Smokes podcast. This is Carl Muller, and I'm joined today by one of our co-hosts, Kay Hiramine. Kay, is what are you smoking today, Kay? I'm smoking a Padilla Maduro. Padilla Maduro. Excellent, excellent. I'm smoking, I don't know, I'm smoking a gift cigar, which is always my favorite cigar. <laughs> the Camarillo... I don't know what it is, but it, it tastes very nice. Nice, dark, dark wrapper. And we are honored to have Steve Grison here with us in this podcast. Steve, Steve say a few words. <laughs> Happy New Year, guys. <laughs> we are recording this episode on December 31st. For our listeners that don't know, we are at the Lion's Den. I'm Steve Ryder, and... Uh, Carl and Kay, you guys are running with this, so go ahead and take well, it. Well, I was just about to introduce our incredibly special guest on this podcast, Steve Ryder. Most of you will know him by his resonant, deep baritone voice yes. and his ability to deliver on what I would consider the premier cigar-based podcast in America today. <laughs> uh, and Steve Ryder... Uh, producer, director, uh, guru extraordinaire of the Holy Smokes podcast is the subject today. We're going to talk about Steve Ryder's story today. Steve, welcome. Oh. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Kay. Steve, it was <laughs> it was fortuitous for you to have just happened to have walked in when mm. right before we had started recording. He so saw he saw the cloud. <laughs> he saw the cloud. <laughs> the incense that goes up before the Lord. <laughs> Steve, yes. What are you smoking today? I am smoking a Casa Cuevas Edición Limitada. Um, <laughs> I, got, I got, I got a so on uh, Friday of last week. So probably would have been like the twenty seventh, maybe I think of December twenty nineteen. I was over at Tim Long's house. Now Tim Long is a member of the group. He lives in Corona. He has his own podcast and YouTube channel called Dad's Smoking Cigars. Mm. And so they've, they've seen quite a bit of growth. Um, they are in March going to be doing the first Pacific Cigar Show in the Phoenix area. Wow. And so, Tim, I met uh, through the group and I just got back from three weeks in Australia. We drove to L.A., um, actually Eastvale, Inland Empire. Uh, Corona Norco area. So I spent some time with my father-in-law. And on the way out there, I spent probably, the family and I spent probably about four days there. And I got together with uh, Kyle Mann from the Babylon Bee. Listeners have no yes. doubt seen that episode in the feed. And then uh, that evening, Matthew McDavid at Culebra Cigar Company in Ontario, California, we had the very first Inland Empire Holy Smoke. And it's just a handful of people that showed up, but Tim showed up. And so it was a chance for me and Tim to really kind of talk to each other and get to know each other some more. And so anyway, on the return trip back, Tim had me come over to his house. It was like 10, 15 minutes from my hotel. And so I went over there, had a cigar, appeared on his podcast. And then he invited a dude named Brandon Wells from Cigar Mechanic, which is a cigar brokerage in the Western United States. And uh, Brandon came over, we had a cigar, talked a little bit more, and he handed me like about six cigars for me to try. And so I said, hey, I'm saving these for the podcast. So Brandon <laughs> Wells, this is one of those cigars that I saved for the podcast. And Thank Carl you. has one of them as well. Yes, so is, excellent. Is Brandon a, a member now of Holy Smokes? Yes, he is. I, I added him that Friday night, tagged you in the post. Awesome. And uh, he's actually going to be in town here in Colorado Springs this week. And so he's coming through at some point and he said he's going to text me. Oh, I need to text him. I need to remember to do that before we're done. Yeah, we'll have to have a Holy Smokes done. with him. Exactly. We'll, so yeah. we'll have something either here or at the Cigarage yeah. or Rendezvous or, or somewhere. All of, them. all of them. Exactly. And and so he's, he's going to be spending, he does some work with Stag. Um, he, he's a rep for Cuevas. And uh, so through his brokerage, he... he this is one of his top cigars that he uh, brokers for. I'll have to try one of those. Love that. Yes. Get into that swag. Yeah, absolutely. So, Steve. Yes. You're okay. an intriguing individual. A mystery wrapped in an enigma. <laughs> <laughs> Covered in a cloud of smoke. <laughs> Covered in a cloud of smoke. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you are the voice 
of so many podcasts. And I want to hear later on after you tell your story about your background, your history, but how'd you went into the whole podcasting media space, how yeah. the Lord kind of led you into that. What's yeah. your passion? What are some things you are really excited about yeah. in this medium of, of podcasting, which is just, just exploded when it comes to popularity and everything. And, so let's hear a little bit about your history. What, what, what You grew up in a place called Wisconsin? Yes, I grew up in South Central Wisconsin, about 30 miles straight north of Madison. It was a unique area to have grown up because uh, while Columbia County, which is the county I grew up in, Dane County is where Madison is, Dane County is incredibly liberal. In fact, there was a 2020, I remember watching 2020, uh, they did a report about the first gay pride statue in a public park and that was in the Madison it was in Madison Wisconsin and one of the things they said was and this is like 1985 maybe 86 mm. so mid 80s and on that report they said that Madison had the second highest gay per capita population outside of San Francisco not just the bay area but San Francisco so Columbia County was very conservative Dane County obviously very liberal i went down to Madison all the time I love Madison. I love that town. Just the lakes and the university and just just the way that the city's laid out. I mean, the capital is on this isthmus between two of the lakes. And so it's just, it's during the summer, it's beautiful. During the winter, it sucks and it sucks balls <laughs> because it's cold and humid and gray and just miserable. But summers and fall and even spring are just are, are incredible. Mm. And so... Um, I was born and raised into a church-going family. Uh, my parents went to an Assemblies of God church. Uh, my, I found out through my grandma that my great-grandpa, her dad, so my mom's mom's dad, got saved at an Assemblies of God tent revival wow. out in the Dodgeville, Wisconsin area. That's, that's where he kind of settled. When he came over from Germany, he took classes to learn English, picked up cheese making as his trade, and then, uh, exactly. So I am a cheesehead. Truly, a I cheese am a true head. cheesehead. And so, anyway, he got saved at this at this tent revival, and and it fundamentally changed the course of really my family's life because they were they were solid Christians. I mean, my dad's side of the family they were Lutheran and they're good people. And my grandma went to church. My dad's mom went to church regularly. I saw her involved in the community in that way. But um, in, in terms of a, a real relationship with God. Uh, I, I definitely saw that through my grandma, through my mom's mom, and through my mom. And uh, so it, that, that really kind of changed the trajectory of, of our family. But anyone that knows about the AG denomination during the 70s and 80s understands how legalistic it was and how going to a freaking junior high dance was deemed a sin, and I wasn't able to go. Because, oh, after all, what kind of sin's going to happen? Oh the, oh, the sins that we could commit at a junior high freaking dance. <laughs> Cards were a sin. Cigars were obviously a sin. Jesus didn't turn the water into wine. He turned it into grape juice. And, and just all of that stuff. It, I, I like to tell people, to give an example of, of just the level of idiocy, really, mm -hmm. that, that I saw growing up. I remember we were um, going to a Milwaukee Brewers game, the Royal Rangers. So Royal Rangers is kind of the boys group for uh, the church where right. the young men uh, are, right. are, are like a Boy and, Scouts. Yeah, of. exactly. Yeah. So Royal Rangers. I was I was a member of the Royal of our church's Royal Rangers, and we were going to a Brewers game, and we were going to stand up in front of the church on a Sunday to talk about it, to tell to tell about it, and getting ready to to go stand in front of the church. Our leader told us, okay, we can't say brewers because by saying brewers, we're condoning alcohol and we can't be doing that. So we're going to call them the Milwaukee Baseball Club. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> and so for me, that, that just really put yeah. just a, fine a, a, bad, a bad taste in my mouth yeah. of, okay, if they're wrong about this, if they're... If, if playing Uno is a sin because because the church's the pastor's wife felt like she had a problem with it, and all of a sudden it's it's bad for the entire congregation, what else are they wrong with? Right. right. And did, so, she have, did she have a problem because she was losing? No, she had a problem because she wanted to play it all the time. Oh, okay. So because because she addictive behavior exactly 
Exactly. And, and so I, I just started to reject so much of what they taught me. I believed in God, but I just, I was just like, you know what? I'm tired of, you know, not being involved, not being able to go to a dance and hang out with my friends and interact with girls in that kind of a environment. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I was like, you know what? Screw this. Mm -hmm. And so I started to drink, sort of smoke weed. Um, this is probably junior year of high school, senior year of high school, especially. And uh, really just started to just reject a lot of that. I still believed in God, still mm -hmm. believed in Jesus. But I just got to that point where I was just, you know, I don't want anything. I don't want this. Yeah. I don't want this. Yeah, it was limiting. Exactly. It was just such a small view. There, there, there wasn't freedom yeah. in Christ. I right. didn't see at, right. I didn't see that. Right. I didn't see, as Matt Hurd loves to say, life and life more abundantly. Right. I didn't, which is an odd scripture, obviously, but but I, I didn't see anyone modeling that, and so I, I wanted to kind of see for myself. Okay, it, is marijuana bad? Is is sex with my girlfriend bad for me? Is you know, do, do I see do I see any bad stuff coming out of that? And sure enough, I did. But yeah. I'm fascinated by this because I had very similar, although not Pentecostal based fundamentalism, Baptist based fundamentalism. Yeah. Which is, which is very similar. Which is very which similar. Very similar. Even just though one, they're very just, different and think they're just, both just, probably misguided. Yeah. Which, which one just speaks <laughs> in tongues and the other one doesn't yeah. believe that you do. But when, when you experienced that sort of rebellion, what was the thought process? Were you were you you said you still believed in God? You still believed you still thought that that was good. What what were you trying to express? I I just wanted to find myself. Yeah. I, I I felt with such a limited scope of what I could do and what was a sin and what wasn't deemed a sin that it I I just couldn't I couldn't express myself. There was no because because we lacked that freedom. I just rejected it all, really. I, not all of it, all of it, but I, I rejected so much of it. And yeah. yeah. How long did that period last? It lasted, it lasted a few years. So I went off to college, and my first year of school, I, I went for police science. Um, I wanted to be a cop, but the very first class, well, it was probably my third class on the very first day. The instructor basically laid out all the bad stuff about being a cop. 80% divorce rate, high alcoholism, high drug abuse, high, you become a cynic because, because you're dealing with, with, with really the, the lowest rungs, of the most broken people in our society. You really just start to look at people very differently. And, and once, once he said that 80% divorce rate, I was like, I, I kind of sat back and I was like, I don't want to put that kind of stress on my future family. And so I finished off that semester. I really, and looking back, I probably should have just dropped all those classes and signed up with some different ones, just some general eds and knocked them out. But after the end of that, I, I, but I, I think I had my heart, heart set so much on becoming a cop and eventually probably working for the state. Um, that, that was kind of my goal was, was not to just be a local or a county cop, but work for the state, maybe even the feds, go on to work, get my bachelor's and you know maybe work for the FBI or some federal agency so, so I, I finished that out and I, I wanted to get into sports medicine I, I love love sports and and because I had uh, two knee surgeries before I was 19 years old there was something about just the whole being around sports and coaching and physical therapy that I really liked and so I enrolled at University of Wisconsin lacrosse which mm -hmm. lacrosse is a border town right on the Mississippi River, um, probably a half hour from Rochester, Minnesota. What's the, what's the beer they brew there? Pabst. Pabst. Pabst Blue Ribbon yes. originally was, was there. Now, yes. now, it's, now it's gone. They do some other stuff there. But um, <laughs> PBR, before PBR, was, was a chick kind of <laughs> millennial thing. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so I spent two years at lacrosse and wasn't able to make it into the sports medicine department because a week before I went up there, for classes that very first year, they sent me a letter saying, "Hey, you don't have a dorm, so you got to <laughs> if you want to go to school here this fall, you got to find an apartment." And and oh. so I, I wasn't able to volunteer the number of hours that I needed to in in the sports medicine department because I was working at Little Caesars and Shopco and wherever <laughs> else I could in order to pay for my little apartment. And um, so 
Steve, so, this is Kay. So, yeah. how, how did you ruin your knees? Doing what sport? So, football. Fo- oh. fo- so, so, the first one, my right knee was football. Okay. And then my left knee was, I was working at a go-kart track in Wisconsin Dells. And anyone that's been to Wisconsin Dells knows it's a <laughs> tourist town with lots of stuff to do during the summer. They've got outdoor water parks. Now they have a bunch of indoor water parks. Anyone that's in the Midwest, they likely know of Wisconsin Dells. And so I worked at a big chief go-kart. And um, so I was waving everyone in for, uh, for they were done. And this guy just took off and, and just kind of just went through for one more lap. And so I take off running across these lanes of, of you know, there's no one there. And so I, I take off running, and, and after the last one, I land and I hyperextend my knee. Didn't do any massive damage. It, wasn't, it, was, it was just a knee scope where they cleaned it up. And, yeah. and, uh, but, yeah, that, the rest of that summer, I was, I was laid up and got workman's comp, and it was freaking amazing because I was getting paid. <laughs> I was getting paid because I couldn't work. And I was like, wow, this, if this is retirement, I can't wait. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's awesome. So I just want to say this is this is a classic kind of holy smokes time. We, and we're really blessed in that here in Colorado Springs we have sort of a developed a more mature, not advanced, but just a developed culture of holy smokes here. So here we are, four of us guys smoke cigars. Yeah. And a dear friend comes walking up and and it's Kevin Kamis- Yeah. <laughs> Kev, Kevin McCoskey and and uh he is a just a sommelier of of coffee he's the coffee guru yeah, man. he's a coffee guru q gray coffee i mean so he, he's come over and and i brought him some coffee from bandung indonesia so he's right now actually are you roasting serious? some fresh coffee for us to have with our our cigars so he's We're, he's come over so if you hear some background noises i just yes, want to tell you that's what it is that he's that he's <laughs> he is he is roasting our our, our fresh coffee and we're when gonna have we some amazing say, Fine drink. Hello. We're not kidding. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, are, we are big tent. We go from very nice coffees to very nice, nice bourbons drinks. and whiskeys. <laughs> That's yeah. Right. And ports and sherries and That's such. Right. Yeah. So, Kay, you, you asked me how did I get into media. Yes. And it was the point at which I didn't get into the sports medicine department at lacrosse that I took a year off of school because that last semester I actually got pneumonia during walking pneumonia during finals week. I pushed through and be, it, because I was working two jobs, plus going to school full time. And it, my, my roommates were really, uh, one, one whose parents lived close, he was never there. The other one, his girlfriend, he was always gone for his girlfriend. And so it was me there at the apartment pretty much by myself. And so I was just pushing through work in. Yeah, so I took a year off and I was, I was kind of like, okay, God, what do you want me to do? It was, it was at, at this point, I'd really started to get, not fully, but I'd started to give my life back to God. Mm-hmm. I'd quit drinking. I'd quit doing any drugs. I'd gone straight edge. And anyone that's familiar with straight edge knows it's, it's, a, it's a subculture of the punk mu- movement, mm-hmm. a hardcore movement. It, it started with uh, um, uh, re- one of the big bands uh, back in the 80s was Minor Threat. And Ian McKay, who went on to start f- the band Fugazi, um, it, it was a no drinking, no drugs, no promiscuous sex. And in fact, there were a lot of vegans with, within that community. I wasn't going that far because I love my cheeseburgers like UK. <laughs> and and so, so anyway, I, I'd gone straight edge, so I quit doing the drinking and the drugs. And uh, the, the only thing I did was an occasional cigar, which I loved, loved, loved. <laughs> didn't, know any, didn't know the good stuff. All my cigars were got at gro- were bought at grocery stores and, and gas stations and Swisher Sweets and, and Philly's tips at the Phil- end. <laughs> Phil- Philly's Titans and whatever else. In fact, the, I, st- the I still- sweepings of the rolling floor. Exactly, right. exactly. I didn't know the difference. I just I thought it looked cool. And so, <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I I was kind of praying during that time. I was asking, okay, God, what do you what what do you want me to do? And I uh, really felt like I, I remember I got flashes of being in fourth grade and my uncle buying me a Fisher Price cassette recorder and making radio shows with my friends and my brothers. And then I remembered in sixth grade, an opportun- someone came into my sixth grade class and said, or my, I think my teacher said, hey, who wants to do a part-time 
kids news segment for the radio station in Portage, WDDC and WPDR. And I was like, boom, I just raised my hand. I'm like, yes, I totally want to do it. And uh, I, I, I just remember my, senior, I remember my senior year of high school, in one of the classes, we had to create a radio spot for the morning announcements. And so I created this radio spot, and I did it with a, with a classmate. And she, as I was putting it together, she looked at me, and she's someone that I'd known since the first grade. And she was like, Steve, I've never seen you smile like this before. Huh. <laughs> all right. And so I remember that stuff. And I'm like, okay, all right. And so I applied to Mad. I, I had two options I could have gone to. I could have finished my bachelor's at University of Wisconsin Madison. I was accepted. But and the other option was Madison Media Institute in Madison, Wisconsin. And part of me was like, I just want to be done with school and get it done. Madison, U- UW Madison would have been one more year of school and less hands on. Whereas MMI was just much more hands-on one year and I'm Practical done education. And I'm done and I can get a job. And you know, if I want to go pursue, if I want to get my bachelor's, I can go do that at some point part-time down the road. Yeah. And so did that. And it was, um, during that school year, it was actually December 31st, 1996. So today, 25, 13 years ago, I can't, I mean, that. 23 years ago, 23, <laughs> 23 years ago. <laughs> Today, 23 years ago, at, yeah. uh, so I, I called my girlfriend and I said, hey, what are we doing tonight for, for New Year's? And she said, well, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going out with my friends. Since you quit drinking, you're not much fun anymore. <laughs> and I was like, I was wow. furious. <laughs> because for me, for me, something, it, New Year's was special. It was a chance to, you know, kick off the New Year's, especially having a girlfriend. It was like something just cool to just... You know, celebrate. Hey, we're starting a new year and all the stuff that we can do over the course of this next year and just, you know, just celebrate what this last year was. And I'm going to be finishing school. So for me, it was like an extra, you know, celebration. Okay, we're going into 1997. I'm going to be finishing school. We're going to be, I'm going to be getting a career. And, you know, and so I didn't have any, I didn't have any friends around that were around town that day. And so I just stewed at my apartment and I was on AOL kind of just surfing America <laughs> online. And, and I remember just, just the, my blood just boiling as, as the minutes went by more and more and more. And finally, I want to say it was about 1150 something in the evening before midnight. I finally just slammed my fist down on my desk and I said, God, I'm done. I'm a hundred percent done. I've been trying to do this to this point. I'm stuck with this girlfriend I don't think I want to be with anymore. And I don't know what I'm going to do once I'm done with school because Mm -hmm. the only prospects here in the Madison area are working for a local radio station, Mm -hmm. meh, or going to work for uh, Full Compass, which which is like a uh, a music and AV supply company. Mm -hmm. It's like Sweetwater... And, and some of the other ones that, that are out there, Full Compass is, is a big one, but and then they're headquartered in Madison. Those are the only two prospects that I really had in Wisconsin. And so that, that was the scope of what, what I knew I could do other than going off to you know, Central California and going to work for Skywalker Sound or going to Nashville, New York, LA, working at a post-production big, studio. Yeah. So, so the, the, those were options as well because, because I, I didn't go into the radio and TV portion of of the uh, um, program I, I focused on audio production music production so it was it was a more broad studio production so that way I, I wasn't just limit I wasn't just limited to working at radio stations I, I had opportunities to go work for post-production studios and that kind of stuff and so I, I just remember slamming my fist down and saying God I'm done I'm yours take me and do whatever you want so that next so the next day I broke up with my girlfriend And it was like the next Sunday, there was a church like a block away from me that I went to and they were starting the starting 1997 off with a 40 day fast. Mm. And so I'm like, I'm not doing 40 days, but I'll do three. I'll do three. Yeah, I'll I'll join you guys for three. And I did that three day fast. And uh, literally within a week, I was in an AOL chat room witnessing to a dude. He blew me off and someone came alongside and just kind of encouraged me and said, Hey, it's all right. We started a conversation and then it started to go some emails back and forth. And then it was a letter and she sent me a picture and she was freaking hot. And I was like, 
All right. Wait. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, she was going to Oklahoma Baptist University, and her parents lived here in Colorado Springs. And so I skipped my graduation, and I went down to o- OBU to hang out with her and her friends for a few days. I got a hotel there, like probably three nights, two, three nights, and then uh, drove down there, came back, and uh, her dad worked for Western Pacific Airlines at the time. And anyone that knows Westpac, thank you, Kevin. Mm-hmm. Well, we got to put a hold on that. Yeah. While we all sip a marvelous Indonesian. Ethiopian. Ethiopian. Yeah, wow. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Thank Cheers. you so much, Kevin. Thank you. I'm glad I can contribute somehow. <laughs> well, by the way, for the listeners, we will be having Kevin on at some point in 2020. I say probably quarter one. He's got a great story. Kevin, this is fantastic coffee. I just made it. Did you just roast the beans and everything? No, that's from Building 3 in uh, Colorado Springs. Mm. Nice. Mm. All right. Well so, said. So, so, so anyway, I finished that three-day fast, meet this girl, go to, go to Shawnee, Oklahoma to go meet her. And then uh, drive back, and her dad works for Westpac Airlines, a now defunct airlines that was headquartered here in Colorado Springs. And he sent me a buddy pass to come out and meet the family. It's kind of as a graduation gift. And so I came out, and as I was getting ready to come out, they were like, focus on the families out here. And I was like, focus on the family, focus on the family. Where have I heard that? Dr. Dobson. <laughs> I remember Dr. Dobson. My mom was a big Dobson supporter growing up. Mm. I mean, my, my mom supported three ministries growing up. She supported PTL. Jim Baker <laughs> supported Jimmy Swaggart. I, I believe she supported them. I, I know he was on every Sunday morning while we were getting ready for church. And so I, th- and I think we got mailers from him <laughs> as well. So chances are she did support him. And then Jim Dobson yeah. and Focus on the Focus Family. On the and, family. Do- and Doc was the only one that didn't embarrass the faith. And so, <laughs> and so I, I had a great respect for him. And also because when I was probably 11 years old, my mom locked me in her bedroom with the Preparing for Adolescence tape series and told, and so Dr. Dobson was the one that told me about the birds and the bees. <laughs> That's and so, great. And, 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 and also, I mean, people may remember in the 80s, Doc had, um, Doc had a Q&A that many denominations would pick up and, and add to their denominational bulletin insert. And so, sure. so my pastor, when I was in high school, was, I'd say, probably about 10 years past his due date. He should have retired a long time prior. <laughs> The guy was so incredibly boring. And so I would just read Dr. Dobson's Q&A and, you know, oh, that, 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 that makes sense. Oh, huh, yeah, that's good advice. And, you know, so, so I always had a great deal of respect for him. So put my, put in my uh, foot in the door and got a job, part-time job in satellite operations and uh, moved out here, got a part-time job at Best Buy. Within three months, I was full-time in the broadcasting division working in... Uh, uh, Dub Bay, which is basically duplication, where we duplicate tapes for people within the ministry that were listening, checking the broadcast and making notes and preparing stuff for correspondence and whatever else. And then uh, within six months, I was uh, the international editor. And But six weeks after I moved here, the girl met another guy at school and dumped me. Oh. And, you know, to be honest, it was probably one of the greatest things that ever happened to me because here I was, you know, 23 years old at the time. And away from all my friends, all my family, and I, I had a chance for God to really build me from the ground up. And mm-hmm. it was those incredible godly men and women at Focus, the new friends that I met at New Life Church. I was involved in their uh, their college and career group, which was called The Exchange at the time. They disbanded it, and then they got another college and career group. But uh, yeah, it was it was it was just absolutely incredible, and. Uh, really built me from the ground up and put a new a new foundation in me that that that's really what God wanted for me. Sure. And that was such an incredible time for focus on the family as, as well. well as new life. That was, as well as as new well life. as new life. Right. Right. Both both organizations were just growing and hopping and new life was really on the cutting edge of, you know, some of the what, what some of the modern churches are doing. I mean, they they had um, they still have Desperation Band, which mm-hmm. was one of the kind of the forerunners of the 
of the uh, um, you know the worship band movement that started to tour and travel and do these shows around the nation and also producing some cutting edge music that other churches were picking up and and so uh yeah i mean them hillsong and there were others but yeah really yeah, new life was really into missions and the 1040 window totally. and the nations and everything yeah it was a mm-hmm. rocking time yeah it was it was it was electric and people were moving here from around this around the country and really around the world to attend new life people were moving here from around the country and around the world to work at focus right and so it it was just it was unbelievable to be around that fantastic so vibrant yeah so you went from wisconsin and then down here to colorado springs yes and you've been here ever since yeah 22 years now 22 years and so you journeyed for years working closely with dr dobson on the radio program right and then tell me more about how that went because obviously then yeah when kara dumped me and I didn't and, know if we were using names. At that's this point, fine. So. That's, I mean, yeah. When, 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 when I got dumped, um, I, I really didn't want to be here anymore because I moved out here for her. And so I, I did my job at focus and, you know, went to new life and was plugged in and made some friends, but I was always looking to leave. Always. I was putting my <laughs> application in at post-production studios in Nashville and New York and LA and Skywalker and I was just trying to get my foot in the door anywhere else. I wanted, to, I wanted to go to that upper level and be at that level. And it just kept, doors kept closing and doors kept closing. And, my, and the VP of broadcasting at the time was not a nice person. Mm. He, he had a lot of stuff going on. I mean, he, he ended up having an affair with someone else at Focus and ended up getting fired. And so he had a lot of stuff in his life going on that, that you know, obviously came out in the way in which he treated me. Mm. Like I, I remember specifically editing a show, sending it out, and then hearing back from Dr. Dobson's office that, hey, he wants this part cut out. And I cut it out and I send out the, the, the new show. And I got a call from this, the, the VP of, Mark, of Broadcasting's office saying, why did you take this out? Uh, because Dr. Dobson told me to. Yeah. Oh, I didn't say you could. Wait, 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 what? You, you, you report to Dr. Dobson. Mm. Why? why? And so, uh, Mm. so I, I wanted to leave and, and it was probably May of 1999, maybe even May of 2000, where I went back to Wisconsin and I put in applications there at local radio stations and at, cause I was like, I don't want to be working for this dude. He is a jerk. He is difficult to work with. I do not want to be with him. And so those doors even closed. And so when I got back, I, I was kind of praying. I'm like, God, what's going on? Mm-hmm. I want to get the heck out of here. I don't want to be here. And, and in my spirit, I just really felt like, no, I'm closing those doors for a reason. <laughs> <sighs> That's a hard message to hear from God All sometimes. Right. So it was at that point that I just decided, okay, I'm just going to put my nose to the grindstone and I'm just going to outwork everyone. I'm just going to do the best job that I absolutely can. I mean, I was doing good, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take things up to a whole new level and I'm just going to just outperform everyone. And, and it was at that point then I started to leapfrog guys at Focus left and right. And uh, within probably I'd say about six months of that happening, Seven months of, of me putting my nose to the grindstone, that VP of broadcasting, it, everything came out and he got fired. And uh, within about a month of that, I met Elizabeth, my now wife. And it was at that point then that I just, like I said, I just started leapfrogging guys at Focus and eventually became Dr. Dobson's chief audio engineer. Actually, first became the manager of broadcast production for the Daily Broadcast. Yeah. And then once I got that job over a guy who had much more seniority over me, he left to go work for FRC, mm-hmm. uh, Family Research Council in D.C., and that opened up Doc's chief audio engineer position, which I had just absorbed into my position, my role and responsibility, which basically meant that anytime Doc traveled, anytime that he went out and did interviews remotely, um, anytime we didn't get enough stuff done in Colorado Springs, we would go to Palm Desert where he has a small two-bedroom condo, in Palm Desert, and we'd record the opens and closes for broadcasts there, set up, and uh, that meant usually I usually I was the one that went with. Well, at, that you know time, at that time, 
I mean, what was the listenership? Probably oh, well, a million, I was just about to say two million that. people, right? Oh, every oh, day. It, it was the every, biggest thing going. It was. It oh, really yeah. Was. With, without question. Without question. So I heard a report when you when you factored in all of our international audience as well, we were reaching 250 million people per day. Yeah, and 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 a big chunk of that, a big chunk of that was the fact that we had some quote unquote secularized commentaries that that were aired on Chinese national radio. It's all good. <laughs> so as the Lions Den goes, the host, the host of, of the Lions of Den. the Lions Den, Derek, Derek Fulmer, Fulmer is here. Just walked in. So the, the the crowd is getting a little bigger. We'll post yes, some pictures. Yes, we love about this. It. This is what Holy Smokes is all about, yeah, man. That's yeah. right. So so we, we were on Chinese national radio, and and they they would uh, pick put a, put us strategically in supermarkets, and so that's where a big chunk of that listenership came from. But here in the United States, I mean, in in two thousand eight, Focus was the first quote unquote religious broadcast inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame. Wow. And, you know, being on a front row seat to that, so to speak, right? You, yeah. You probably have some pretty compelling or interesting components to that, to that journey. Well, what are some of the stories you take from the, that stick in your mind about those years? The, the, biggest, the biggest one for me is that Doc is, ever, one, the, the incredible people that worked around Focus. I mean, one of the really cool things about Focus was I worked with Catholics. I worked with Lutherans. I worked with Presbyterians. Southern Baptists, Fundamental Baptists, Presbyterians, every Reformed denomination, Seventh-day Adventists, Pentecostals, non-charismatics, non-denominational, you name it, I worked with it. And we all had a singular focus of trying to help the family. There was no, within focus, I never saw it. I never saw any denominational infighting. because, Because I knew... I knew this person who is a Presbyterian, and I'm not a Presbyterian, but man, I, so what is it about, you know, uh, you know Calvinism? Ta- tell me about that. I don't understand that. And, and, ta- sure. and, you know, for the Catholics, talk, so talk to me about why you guys pray to the saints and why you guys, okay, I don't necessarily agree with that, but yeah. I know you, and I love you, and you are a great person, and we are in this, we are in the trenches together. And so that that was honestly one, probably the number one greatest takeaway from those years that I the fifteen years that I worked for Dobbs. Yeah. And Just I also the unity and, of the and, body and, that can exactly. be and, and, that way. And I also saw it for coming from Doc because Doc on the broadcast would have Presbyterians. I mean, he would have John MacArthur on, and he would have um, David Wilkerson, mm. and he, he he would have he would have Catholics on, and he would have just all of these. Because he loved, he understood, well, he understood the body of yeah. Christ. I remember working uh, when I was with uh, Brother Andrew in Open Doors. He had Brother Andrew on and telling stories. Uh, those, those things were, for people who don't, who haven't grown up with that in their background, some of the folks maybe listening, uh, it was remarkable that whatever Dobson spoke on became the topic of conversation around churches all across America. And probably around the world as well. Yeah, I mean, so so, so many ministries that he would give a he would give a platform to and say these these they're doing really good things. Like whether it be mothers of preschoolers, mops, right, or uh, moms in touch, or any other ministry. And those, so many are, of them were birthed out of exactly yes. exactly. I mean, I mean, uh, when Neil Clark Warren started eHarmony, Doc and Neil Clark Warren had a great relationship. I mean, a really 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 good relationship. And so when Neil Clark Warren start, came up with the idea of eHarmony, he came on the Focus broadcast and talked about it. Now, yeah. I had just met Elizabeth two weeks prior and was like, well, if this one doesn't work out, then I'm going to go check gonna out go eHarmony. Try e-harmony. <laughs> this sounds like a very cool th- source, I, uh, service. But I, I was singles pastor at Saddleback Church when, when Neil Clark Warren came and launched in a public way at Saddleback yeah. eHarmony. and. It was exactly that. And the next couple of weeks, I heard him on, on Focus, and yep. it was already off and running. And it yep. became, I don't know, 100 million people now, something on, on that yeah. platform. So. And, and I think the other thing that I pulled away from those years was Doc is everything behind with the microphones turned off 
and in private that he is in front of those microphones. That's good to know. I mean, he, he is a genuine human being. He's, he's obviously a type A driven human being who, who, you know, expects greatness out of his staff and the people around him because yeah. he gets, he, he expects that out of himself. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I expect greatness out of myself too. And so he and I really got along well on that, on that level as well. I mean, both he and I ha- share this love for history and love for football. <laughs> especially college football and, the and history so of football. And, 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 and so doc would give me a hard time about me being a badger fan because it was like in the mid 70s they weren't so great well not only not only were they were they not so great but doc actually after he finished his doctorate went to the university of wisconsin to tour the campus and talk with some of the professors and some of the i, I don't remember who it was that he, that he met with and this is obviously long before he was dr dobson and uh, so, anyway, the, and anyone that's familiar with University of Wisconsin history knows that the 70s were very tumultuous. I mean, there were student riots going on. There was a bombing on the campus. There was just a lot of stuff going on. And they actually, a bunch of students actually saw Doc and some other of these suits walking across campus and went and basically roughed them up. Didn't beat them up, but just basically kind of threatened them and got in their faces. And Doc said, I've never feared for my life more than, than that moment. So he, he, didn't, he didn't have a, a, a good thing to say about Wisconsin, but he, <laughs> he loved me and he gave me a hard time about being a badger. And, and, uh, but my, my favorite Dr. Dobson story that I'd love to tell was I'd, probably, I'd been a senior engineer for probably, I'd say, about a year. And we went out to Palm Desert to record the opens and closes for broadcasts. And so when we would do this, especially if it was during the summer, we couldn't have the air conditioning clicking on and off because if you hear it suddenly click on, it's the, if you're going to be making an edit, it's going gonna, it's gonna to screw up that edit. And so we had to basically crank the AC, shut it off for the three hours that we were recording break for lunch, turn it back on. And then when we come back, we'd turn it off again. And so we'd sit around in shorts and t-shirts and surely make us lemonade. And anyway, broke for lunch, came back, and then we all went to dinner. So it was me, Doc, Shirley, and John Fuller, the VP of broadcasting at the time. So this is probably, I'd say about 2008, 2009. So we're eating dinner together, just laughing, having a great time. And, uh, we're gonna, we all wrap up and Doc and Shirley see someone that they wanna meet and they say, okay, we'll meet you over at the frozen yogurt place. This is where it's at, here's the address. We'll meet you over there. So John Fuller and I walk out to the car. I peel off to go to the restroom. And when I come out, Doc and Shirley are about 15 to 20 yards in front of me. And they're holding hands. Uh Here's a couple that have been married 48 years at the time, maybe 47 Mm. when that happened. And I saw the way in which he loved his wife. I saw the way in which he would stop everything for a, for a call from her or from Ryan, his son, mm-hmm. or from Danae, his daughter. He would stop everything for them. And, and so he made his family a priority, and that was just an unbelievable example. And I saw the way in which he loved his staff, and he would check in and see how you know, we were doing and you know, ask, you know, how's your wife doing, or how's this going on, or find out something was going on and just kind of check in and... So not only was he the founder of Focus on the Family, he really was focusing on his own family. As oh, well. without question. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Without question. Great testimony. Yeah. yeah. And you moved on from there when Dr. Dobson moved on. Yeah. So when, when the Focus board decided to finish that leadership transition, Doc had established kind of a timeline, not really a timeline, but kind of a series of events. Okay. I'm going to step down as the president. I'm going to stay on as a chairman. I'm going to step down as the chairman. Then I'm going to probably stay on as the voice of the broadcast, and then eventually I'll retire from that as well. And so during that time, I could see things weren't going the way in which that he wanted. There, there was some, some friction was starting to happen between him and the focused leadership. And uh, when, he, that, when he made that announcement that he was going to be done on the broadcast, I could see it didn't go down the way that he wanted and so he said, I'm going to pop up somewhere back on radio. I don't know where, I don't know when, but keep your eyes peeled. So we finish that recording, wrap it up. Everyone clears out. It's a Sunday, which we never recorded on Sundays. And so as I was shutting everything down in the studio, uh, I, I turned to my computer and I typed him an email and I said, listen, I've loved working for you the last 12 and a half years. You want to start something new? 
I've got dreams of doing bigger things than just studio recordings the rest of my life. And so two weeks later, he called, offered me a position, and I was the second employee he hired after his assistant to help start what ended up becoming Family Talk. Huh. And uh, we, we kind of built that thing from scratch. And I went up to his office a whole bunch during that time, and we kind of talked and kind of brainstormed about, you know, hey, what, what is this going to look like? Well, how, what are we going to do? And, uh, yeah, I, I, but early, I, I remember it was like the very first official Family Talk meeting I could see that this wasn't going to be where I was going to be long term because we had an opportunity. We had two radio syndicators that wanted to take Doc into secular radio, general market radio. And I was all on board for it because I'm like, one, we don't have to raise our own money. Two, <laughs> it's going to open up some whole new people. Any advertiser that comes on board is going to know exactly what to expect from Dr. James Dobson because he has 35 years of archives. Right. That people will be able to go back to and be able to understand, is this someone that I want to be, that I want to advertise with? For me, it was just a no brainer. And in fact, if I remember right, one of the syndicators was one of the ones that helped get Rush going mm. nationally. And I was like, this is just, this is just too good to be true. We need to do this. And he, I remember him looking at me and saying, Steve, I know Christian radio. I know Christian radio and I know we can do this. And I don't feel comfortable going in, going on board with this. And for me, it just felt like a gigantic mistake. But yeah, he, he's the boss. <laughs> and, and so we, we went forward with it. And uh, the money never really came in. Mm. I was doing two daily radio broadcasts with half the staff. I had a focus to do one. Mm. And I couldn't step back from the workload. Yeah. And my identity being wrapped up in being, quote unquote, Dobson's guy. Yeah that I couldn't take a look and figure out, okay, how do I manage this workload with the staff that, that, that I've been given? Because uh, when, it, when it came down to it, the, the interim COO, when we got started, he basically said, okay, Steve, here's what I got for you. You can either have two entry-level editors or you can have one experienced editor. You can't have your two experienced editors that you want. Mm. Rick. <laughs> So, all right. So I, so I, so I had a, a, a former intern who wasn't working in radio and I called her up and I said, Hey, you want to, you want a full-time job? Yes, absolutely. And then I got another intern who worked out well and uh, hired him and they ended up getting married. So <laughs> that can, that's a side benefit. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But, now, but you then started your own company, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, so in, 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 uh, in 2011, I, really started to feel the effects of burnout coming that last six months that I worked for doc. I just, it was just, it was killing me. It really started when John Ramstead had his accident. We, we had, mm. we had, and John Ramstead, I don't know when we air this, I'll probably air John's episode before my episode, just so that way listeners can have a context for it. Mm. But uh family talk donor event in great falls, Montana, First night of the event, Doc had everyone kind of tell their stories. I saw this guy named John Ramstead, who was a very successful financial advisor in Denver. And I was like, I want to get to know this dude. So we had a great conversation. Next morning, we're doing this trail ride down to uh, this um, picnic area. And John's horse, as everyone's kind of getting saddled up, takes off. He and the horse go into a steel corral fence. He nearly dies. Most horrific thing I've ever seen in my life. I was the first one to get to him after he hit the fence. This is the most horrific thing I've ever seen. From, seen. So John's accident happens on a Friday. Saturday, we, we continue on with, with the event. And the second, the next day, you think we learned to not be around horses, but <laughs> the next day, Dr. Dobson is, we're doing barrel shooting. And Doc's on his horse. And so he shoots the balloon, shoots the balloon. And, you, and when you're doing barrel shooting, you're using blanks. And so right. the powder from the blanks actually is what, what pops the balloon. Bang, bang, bang. Last one, he misses. Turns, shoots again, misses. Last time, it's behind him. So he kind of turns and goes to shoot it again. And his, he was wearing tennis shoes. He wasn't wearing boots. And so his foot slipped out of the stirrup. And I watched him go, bink, kind of off, almost off, falls off the horse. Oh, gosh. Breaks his collarbone, breaks his scapula, cracks seven ribs. And because he was on Coumadin and painkiller and, yeah. and, and blood thinners blood because thinner. of his heart attack yeah. in 1987, 88, when he had his heart attack, yeah. we didn't, Ryan, his son and I run up 
And we look at each other and we're like, we could be watching Dr. James Dobson, Ryan's dad, bleed out internally in front of us. Wow. Because we don't know what kind of... And so I came back from that trip in a really weird place. Sure. And so I'm, I'm... In the six weeks prior, every morning I would wake up, I would hear this song by a band called Under Oath. Casting Such a Thin Shadow is the name of the song. And it's got this little melodic open, and I would just hear it every morning in my spirit when I'd wake up for six weeks. And during that entire time, I'm listening to the song, reading the lyrics, studying and asking God, what are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to tell me? Come on, God. Obviously, you're, you're, you're putting this on my heart for a reason. What's going on? And so, anyway, I'm dry, the, Monday after, my first day in the office after that, after that event, I'm driving Matthew, my son, down to kindergarten. And... As we're driving down Highway 24 from Falcon towards, towards the school, I'm watching this airplane take off from the airport, and the song is kind of, I'm listening to the song, and the song's kind of building, 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 and the airplane's taking off, taking off, taking off. And the point at which the guitars make a hard right turn, the airplane makes a hard right turn. And in my spirit, I heard, clear as day in my spirit, this is your career. Hmm. And so I'm just quiet. I'm like, okay, what else? God, you got to tell me something else. Nothing. And right around that time, I see a sign, one of those orange construction signs on the side of the road that says, slow down, work ahead. And in my spirit, just kind of just pings like, okay, pay attention to that. So I get to work that morning and it really felt like the hand of protection that was over my career was lifted the moment I walked in that door. It felt different. Suddenly, I had coworkers accusing me of stuff that I never did. I had uh, just the, there was tension on the mm-hmm. broadcast staff that there wasn't before. Things were just really starting to fall apart. And so um, over the next six months, I just started to kind of quietly look for jobs because I knew my time was coming to a close there. And it got to the point where I got a call from a buddy of mine who was a VP of broadcasting. He was at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Nashville, and he called me. He said, Steve, I hear, dude, I hear you're looking for a job. Oh, frick. It's just a matter of time before Doc finds out. And sure enough, within, within a week, he called me and he called me into his office. And he's like, are you looking for a job? Yes, I am. All right. Turn in your resignation. Wait, wait I, I, don't, I don't have a job yet. Yeah. Doc, Doc came from that old school mentality. Sure. If, you, if you have one eye looking over here, you're, you're, no good, you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're not focused on the work in front of you. And so it's just time for you to move on. And for, and for me, it felt incredibly heartless at the time. But yet looking back, it was one of those things, just like when Kara broke up with me in 1997. It was one of those things that I needed in my life because it brought me to a point where God rebuilt me in a different way where my ego was completely stripped away. I mean, I had so much of my identity wrapped up in being Dobson's guy. So much of my identity. And so much of my identity wrapped up in being a provider for my family. Sure. That when all of that was stripped away, it was a chance really for God to show up in a whole new way and make himself real in a way that I'd never experienced before in my life. I mean, yeah. we, Elizabeth and I look back at our finances and we're like, we have no idea how we kept a roof over, why we continue to pay our mortgage and how we were able to keep food on the table and how we were able to pay for gas and whatever else by, based on the income that we were, that I was occasionally bringing in and people were gifting us and whatever else. And uh, it, it was one of those things where it really, really strengthened my faith to a level that um, as painful as it was, as hard as it was, I wouldn't trade it Amen. for anything. Yeah, I really wouldn't. Well, right turn media is certainly taken off like that airplane, and uh, that right turn you now you now produce some of the most listened to and appreciated podcasts and other uh, materials out there. Wh- who are some of your clients now that you work with? Yeah, so um, I, I work with uh, Authentic Intimacy, and they have a podcast called Java with Julie. I've been producing them since since day one. Um, Julie, in fact, she was a friend of mine back even before she got on staff at Focus. She was uh, an occasional voice that we would bring on Weekend Magazine, which I was the technical producer of before I became the uh, the production manager for the Daily Broadcast. 
John Stone Street and the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. So Love Breakpoint, that. The Point, Breakpoint This Week, Breakpoint Podcast. Uh, Mr. Grison, who's sitting next to me, we produce the Exploration Films podcast. I like that obviously. one, personally. Yes. Yeah, and yeah the, the host is just great. <laughs> dude, dude, Dude's awesome. And Mr. Grison is incredible to work with. I love Steve Death. He's just, he's just an incredible dude. And uh, Holy Smokes and a whole bunch of other ones. So It's very exciting. And I think there's so much richness to your story. And to hear the backstory... This is the one thing I love about these podcasts is you've met these people. Sometimes you've you've seen them in, in the Christian world or in other media. And then you hear the backstory like this. Steve. Yeah, it's it's so it's so impressive to hear the way God has shaped and molded and directed and guided your journey. And uh, and it's it's a thrill to be part of this with you. Co-laborers on the on the podcast with uh, with the Godfather of Holy Smokes. Yes. Yes. K. Okay. The man, the myth, the legend. He just, he just put his fingers up like the Godfather. Why are you talking to me like that? <laughs> but uh, Steve, uh, what could we be thinking about where you're going next? Where's the next thing for Steve Ryder? Yeah, um, I, I, was, I was talking to Kay right before this. We, we went out to lunch. And uh, there, there's two kind of courses that, that I'm looking to kind of develop, e-courses, if you will, for different organizations slash segments to get into podcasting and you utilize podcasting in a way that really kind of helps tell their story and helps develop community. One is for churches. So I don't know a single church in the United States. I've yet to find, I think I've only found one, only one that is that all they put into their podcast feed is the weekly sermon. That's it. They might throw in some other occasional stuff like a women's event where, where they've got a speaker coming in, but, but, but they're putting stuff that's in there from the stage. That's all they're putting in there. But there's a whole lot of other stuff that could be thrown in there sure. in, into that podcast feed. It's a valuable piece of real estate where people can find out about what's going on and, and community can be developed. And so I have 22 different pieces of content that a church can throw into their podcast feed in order to help develop community and really help to tell the story of the pastors, the staff, the elders, the overseers, tell the story of the church, to cast vision, to tell stories of elders and deacons and those kinds of things. Incre incredible testimonials. Grandma Higginbottom, your cancer is gone. What happened? Yeah. Just those kinds of things. So that way it develops community and relationships. Wow. Because if someone hears Bill and Susie, the elders, tell their story, someone may listen to that and be like, I can totally identify with that. Hey, Bill and Susie, can we go out to dinner? Can we, can we, because I want to talk to, we're, we're going through something very similar in our marriage. Yeah. And I believe that, that it is probably the most underutilized resource that a church has that they just don't know how to use. And so that's one. And then another one is for medical offices. So doctors, dentists, chiropractors, that kind of stuff for them to be able to use what, not an ongoing podcast, but probably just a, a season where they kind of tell, cast the vision of who they are, why they got into being a dentist or a doctor or whatever else, tell their story. Because there's something fundamentally different between hearing someone tell their story like I am and reading a sterile bio on a website. That's there's true. something That's fundamentally great. different. And so, so I'm, I'm kind of wrestling between those two. And Kay told me to really push forward with the church one first in 2020. He said, he said, he said That's, that's the one where we have the connections to really help get that out to, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. You know I love there's pastors listening now they are going... He's absolutely right. That That's would right. build community, not only in our church, but in our whole town, in our whole city. What I love about that is it's also a bridge from a medium of media, such as podcasting, which is so new to pastors of a certain generation that don't understand that their God-given abilities and gifts of storytelling can be done so naturally through podcasts. And totally. it's reaching a generation that listens to podcasts much more so than listening to a sermon or, I mean, I think if you could, it's almost like 
I almost envision what you're starting here, Steve, is a storytelling institute mm. where you're training people how to be storytellers mm. in a whole new medium of podcasting, which you're gifted at, yeah. which God has blessed you with, with. I mean, you look at your CV, you look at all the experience you have. I mean, I told you as I was walking, I said, you know, I'm bro, I'm so blessed to have you in the Holy Smokes community, Thank you. in my life personally, and to be a part of the Holy Smokes podcast. In that I, I'm privileged and honored that we have one of the best podcast producers in the country, if not the world, and God has anointed you for a way to exponentially grow the kingdom of God, to serve yeah. the kingdom, and to see people come to know Jesus through the podcast medium. Yeah. Amen. So that's why I think that that idea that you have for the future is going to be just exciting for 2020. Yeah. So kind of what I'm thinking right now is developing a pilot group of let's say 12 let's say 10 to 15 churches that 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 want to be a part of this and kind of test it out and see how it works and develop this curriculum and develop and that that's kind of what I'm envisioning so sometime in Q1 2020 to launch that and work with those churches in order to help to be able to give them ideas and 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 you know just to shoot out an email okay this week this is what you're going to try and get so, and, 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 and if you don't have this already in your schedule, then, okay, this is a secondary piece of content that you can throw in there. Or, so if I'm a pastor listening to this right now, and I want to be part of that cohort, so to speak, to learn from each yeah. other and to be discipled by you and mentored by you in this, mod, in this podcast medium, um, they can contact you through this podcast or yes. they can contact you through Right Turn Media? Yes. So rightturn.media is the website, rightturn.media. My email is steve.writer, R-E-I-T-E-R, at writeturn.media. And, uh, or you can contact us through the Holy Smokes public Facebook page. Find me on Facebook. I mean, there, there are lots of ways to get, to get a hold of me and just say, hey, I'm th- hey this sounds really interesting. I'd love to, love to talk more. Well, Steve Ryder, it's been a huge blessing and privilege to, to hear this journey and to, to be part of this with you and uh, it's this is like family conversation right here, and I, I love that. And um, I know we want to do the uh, we want to do the, uh, the the lightning round, rapid fire questions, rapid fire questions. Rapid fire. But uh, I don't have them in front of me right now. I'll get now. them for you. I'll get so, them for you. Okay, so we'll do those, and we'll add that in the uh, in the mix. But uh, what a blessing! What a privilege! And uh, I just want to say to everyone listening to this podcast, if you're blessed by this, do let us know. Let us know uh, at uh, holysmokes.club um, and give us the best thing that has been ministering to you through this podcast. We're excited that you're part of this journey with us and looking forward to having many, many more conversations like this, Steve. Thanks, Carl. All right. Thanks, Kay. Steve Ryder. Yes. It is time for rapid fire questions. Ooh. All right. Here we go. Hey everyone, before we get to my rapid fire segment, I want to share a note that Kay and I got from an 80 year old listener that lives in Southeast Kansas and still works in his small town family business. He told us, I really lack male friendships because so many of my friends have passed in the last few years. So I would value a group of men to spend time with. I'm learning some valuable lessons and wish I was 30 rather than 80. I plan to stay tuned for more interviews. May God continue to bless you and your group in 2020. He also talked about how he wrestled with that concept of men and women partaking in fine tobacco and drink because of the church and denomination he grew up in, but the podcast is changing that. When I showed this to Kay at his house recently, we both started tearing up. This is my why for this show. So if that moved you, would you consider partnering with us? Kay and I want to develop the website to better facilitate groups, even groups in small towns like in Southeast Kansas or Madison, Wisconsin, where I grew up. We want to travel and get stories for the podcast. We want to get back to doing two episodes each week, but we need your help. There are two simple ways you can help us out. One is to become a regular supporter at Patreon. You can visit patreon.com slash holy smokes and there at Patreon, you can get early access to episodes, ad free versions, swag, and more patreon.com slash holy smokes, or you can make a tax deductible donation at paypal.me slash holy smokes club. That's paypal.me slash holy smokes club. 
Both of those links are in the show notes. And uh, thank you for the few that have partnered with us so far. Thanks. Rapid fire. Fire. Here. Cigars or pipe? Cigars. Although, although I am starting to get into pipe a little bit more. My wife has told me that I can smoke a pipe down in my office. And so um, I've, I've gotten a bunch of stuff ready to be able to do that. And uh, yeah, she likes the smell of pipe and she said it's okay. Just as long as I air out my, my office downstairs. So that's a good start. Yes, it is. Most expensive cigar you've ever smoked. Uh, you, chances are it was probably gifted to me. The, the, I'll tell you this. The most expensive cigar I've ever purchased was, um, let's see, what was it? It was a $25 stick at Culebra Cigar Company in Ontario, California. And, uh, oh, dang it. I can't remember what it was now. It was probably a brand that's known in Cuba. Monte Cristo. So, Monte so, Cristo. So, so it, all right, so it was a Monte Cristo. I don't remember which one it was, but it's obviously one that you could buy in the United States. And I, I think I paid 25 bucks for it and then uh, saved it for uh, going down. I, I had a cigar with Joe Gersey right next to LAX. He was staying at, a, at an RV park just next to LAX. <laughs> and so, so we, we were sitting outside listening to the ocean and that, 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 was, that was an incredible experience. And how about the... One that was gifted to you, nicest cigar. You know, I it was probably early on, and I don't know which one. It might it might have been a Cohiba Bihike by someone. Um, yeah, but I don't I don't think I've smoked anything that's that someone paid more than fifty bucks for. We'll have to change that, Steve. I am very open, very open to being gifted with a with a very nice cigar. I'm very open. Steve, what was the most memorable experience you've had? All right, so I think. There, there are a couple of memories that come, that come to mind. One is obviously when I sat with Joe in that cigar next to the Pacific Ocean. There was something just magical about it. I love the ocean. I love, 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 love the ocean. It is like my love language. The ocean and the mountains. And if Colorado could have ocean, this would be the... I mean, Colorado is just an incredible state. But the, there, there would be no place in the world I would, I would rather go than a place with the ocean and mountains. So with Joe was one... Uh, probably around 2002, 2003, I, I would host these occasional poker nights for guys at Focus, uh, Focus on the Family, and and we would they, we, we'd have a bunch of guys in my garage playing poker. And Jerry Handlin, the uh, the broadcast engineering manager, he ran broadcast engineering. He brought cigars. He loved cigars. And uh, anyway, he he brought a one off, which is now produced by Illusione Cigars, and we've had a number of them on the Holy Smokes podcast because Howard at Illusione has sent us some, some cigars for the podcast. But that was the first cigar. I, I told you I smoked in college. I smoked Philly, mainly Philly Titans. Those are the ones that I probably liked the most. But nobody, I, I didn't have anyone around me that, that, that could tell me, Steve, these, these, are, uh, these are turds. And you, you, here, here's, here's a $4 stick that you can get over at this shop right here, which yeah. is a great stick. I didn't have anybody that was that was doing that in my life, and so for me to taste that one-off, it was it was almost heavenly. Wow. It, it was something. It was the first cigar that I fell in love with, and so it's a magical that, time when you oh, have that. And and, yeah. and 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 then I think the th- the third memory that comes to mind was the very first Holy Smoke that I ever went to, mm. because because I had met you just a few days prior, yeah. and, and you added me to the group. And I showed up at Paul's house and I started talking with people around the group. And I was like, I found my tribe. I yeah. found my people. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how it's not necessarily the cigars itself, but it's the experience and the relationships. Without that question. That really enhances the yes. cigars. Yeah. yeah. More so. Yeah. Like, like, like another memory was we just got back from three weeks in Australia and my brother and I had three cigars. And two of them were, we, we rented an Airbnb just right across the street from the Indian Ocean. I mean, it was like a... A ninety-second, two-minute walk to get to the Indian Ocean, uh, about two hours south of Perth, and uh, yeah. So Ryan and I smoked cigars, and we just talked about life and That's where awesome. he's at, and where I'm at, and it was yeah. 
it's all about it's all about the experience. Yep. I rarely smoke cigars by myself, and I mean rarely, rarely. It's it's all about just being with people. Average smokes per week. I'd say probably about two. Two. I'd say I'd I'd say between one and two. So okay. Wednesdays when I come, and then obviously the days that we tape Holy Smokes episodes, it goes up. It makes that makes day. up for the lost days. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it, it 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 runs anywhere from one to four per week. Marvel or DC? All right. So growing up, it would definitely be DC because okay. I'm I'm a Super Friends kid. I grew up watching Super Friends the cartoon, and even reading Superman. Um, in fact, the first album that I bought, my first LP that I bought was the Superman soundtrack. And so I freak and I was probably, I don't know, first grade when I got it, it was just, it just, and, and I That's wanted great. to, I wanted to hear the Superman theme song. And so I wanted to be able to play it whenever I wanted. And so I bought, I, with my own money, I bought, bought that Superman LP. And, However, now, you know, it, it's but here's the thing. Even growing up, I was a Marvel fan. Okay. Because I have pictures of me with an Incredible Hulk t-shirt. And the Incredible Hulk t- TV show was on when I was a kid. I was a big Hulk fan. I was a big Spider-Man fan because Spider-Man cartoon was on. And so um, Spider-Man and Hulk in Marvel, I loved as a kid. And then Batman and Superman. But but then also, I, I probably, all those super friends, like, you know, Wonder Twin Powers, Activate, and... Plastic Man. Who I, know, I never hear anything about Plastic Man anymore. But he was big on on the uh, on um, Green Lantern. Is probably one of my favorites also. Green Lantern, which which broke my heart. How bad DC it's an butchered envir- that it's movie. A, it's an environmental ploy. Oh, they're my going gosh. after Plastic Man. <laughs> okay, Star Wars or Star Trek? You know, growing up was hundred percent Star Wars. In high school, I really got into Star Trek. In college, I really got into Star Trek. And I mean, when I say really got into it, I mean I mean really, really, really got into it to the point where I almost bought my own Enterprise uniform to go to a conference, to go to a convention. In my, own, my own, yeah, yeah my my own uh, Starfleet uniform. I was I used to play uh, Starfleet Battles with my cousin, which was a board game. But then when they re-released the Star Wars movies in the theater before the prequels, then the prequels, uh, it was 100% Star Wars afterwards. That must have made uh, Ralph Winter really happy. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember. I mean, St- Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, is still one of my favorite sci-fi movies of all time. For those of you it listening, just, we had a, a great Holy Smokes podcast. I believe it was episode 9 or 10. If, nine people, or 10, if right? people go Holy back and, and they look at that one, that was an incredible... Thank you, Kay, for... Yeah introducing us because that was just a magical time in his backyard i mean we i mean we 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 recorded for i'd say probably about an hour maybe an hour and 15 and but we were back there in his backyard for three and a half hours and just talking about everything and anything he's so real oh my goodness favorite book not titled the holy bible so a book that i read four times this year 2019 is called high performance habits by brennan burchard I say, honestly, that's one that is definitely up there. Mm. Um, I read so much. Like this year, I, th- I think I've done 59 books and audiobooks, and I'd say only a third of them have been audiobooks. And the audiobooks wow. have mainly been biographies because I don't want to read those over the course of you know a month and a half, two months, which is what it would take me. Instead, I can just listen to it at 2x speed. So High Performance Habits by Brendan Burchard is probably right there up there. Um, Another really, 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 really good one. It was my number one that I read last year, 2018, is Abundance by Peter Diamandis. I mean, he's just talking about how exponential technologies are changing everything and how, how, you know, the the dystopian future that Hollywood likes to paint of, of the rich of like Elysium, the movie Elysium. That's never going to happen because, because all technologies go through this phase of, demonetization democratization he's got a bunch of d's that I, but basically if you look at, at, at automobiles now all of the features that are in those automobiles 20 years ago were in the luxury cars 10 years ago 15 years ago we're in the luxury cars now it just works its way down mm-hmm. you look at the same for tech, other technologies throughout history and it just it works its way down to where the common people can have it where it gets to that demonetization phase and it becomes affordable for everyone and so, Abundance by Peter Diamandis is another, is, is one. Um, I'm big into biohacking. I'm big into the whole anti-aging movement. 
The experts within those fields really believe we, we are on the cusp of adding decades of healthy life to our life, if not way more than that, because of the way that we are tackling aging and the way in which we are extending uh, mouse and rat lives by 40 to 50%. So if, if you can imagine another 40 years of productive work in your life, what can you do with it? And think I, about I, how many cigars you're going to be able to smoke in those oh 40, 50 years. Goodness. And, and not, not just that, though, but also, also the relationships. I mean, That's I, right. I, I, mean uh, I, I listen to a podcast called Bulletproof Radio, and uh, it's, it, Dave has, uh, believes that within the next 50 years, 50% of his life will be, able, will be able to add 50% to his life. And so he says, I plan to live to 180. That's what he's like. I'm, I, I plan on living to at least 180. I look back now at my life and I have so many questions I would love to ask my great grandpa who moved here from Germany about why did he come? What what was it in him that wanted to settle in southwestern Wisconsin? Why did it what drove him to take a night class to learn English? What drove him to pick up cheese making as as his trade? I'd love to I'd love to have a conversation with my great 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 grandpa who came over from England for some reason, went out to San Francisco for the gold rush, made enough money that he was able to go back to Grant County, Wisconsin, which is the very southwest corner of the state, buy what the Grant County, what the newspaper in Platteville called the finest piece of property and build the nicest house. It's not a mansion by any stretch of the imagination. My dad and I drove, through, drove by it last year, and we just kind of took a look at it. I saw it for the first time. It's nothing special. It's a nice, it's a nice house. Brick, lots of windows. Just to, you know, but it was a prime piece of farming real estate. Why did he go from Southwest England to San Francisco and then settle in Southwestern Wisconsin? Why Wisconsin? So this and, and what, that's a great segue then into that. The two final questions that I have for you and of the three people other than Jesus, because everybody's going to say they're going to smoke with Jesus. What three people would you like to have a holy smokes with? Would so, it be one of your ancestors in the past do you think or do you think there's others that's a hard question yeah yeah because i love history so much yeah i mean i love history like when, when i was in second grade and i just learned to read i found this this series of biographies in the library my mom because she took over as the librarian when i was in eighth grade um she estimates that those books were probably fourth to fifth grade reading level and so i just devoured them i love i mean abraham lincoln benjamin franklin George Washington, all of these leaders throughout history, James Cook, the, the naval guy that discovered, the, 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 discovered a whole bunch of islands in the Pacific. That's right. Um, you know, th- there were so many people throughout history that I absolutely love. But, but my three holy smokers would be, number one, Branch Rickey. So Branch Rickey was the general manager and president of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Prior to that, he was the general manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. And prior to that, he was the general manager of the St. Louis Browns, which later became the Baltimore Orioles. When he took over as the, the GM of St. Louis Cardinals, St. Louis at the time in the 1920s and 30s was on the very Western front. It was the frontier still really of America. It was, it was like the, what the, it was the Eastern edge of the West. There were no baseball teams further west. Um, They didn't have the resources. The Cardinals and the Browns didn't have the resources that the Yankees had, that the Red Sox had, that all of those East Coast, that even the Washington Senators had. So they had to figure out how to compete. And Branch Rickey built the farm system. So he was a real innovator in that way. But when he was a college baseball coach, he had an incident that forever changed his life. A deep man of faith and happened to love cigars. And so this is one of the reasons why, why he's my number one. Um, he was a college baseball coach. And they went to South Bend, Indiana to play Notre Dame in a series. And when they checked into the hotel, because their catcher was black, the owner of the hotel said he can't stay here. And Branch basically laid down the law and said, hey, listen, we will all leave. You will lose all of our business if, this, if, if he doesn't stay with us. Wow, and so and so basically, the owner the, the owner of the hotel said, "Fine, you go up there. He, he can stay with you if if you want to be you know tainted with having a, an, a a negro in your room, then you can have him." 
And, and so anyway, Branch sent the catcher up to his room, finished all the checking in and got everyone settled in and went back into his room. And the kid was weeping, weeping, scratching in his arm, saying, it's got to come off. It's got to come off. That's so fundamentally, so fundamentally changed, made an impact on him. When he was, I, I don't even, I don't know if, if, if he was looking to integrate baseball when he, was, when he was the GM of the Browns, but there are reports that he had a short list of Negro League players that he wanted, that he would sign at the drop of a hat. But because Judge Landis, who was the commissioner of baseball, Commissioner Landis, said no to integration. Absolutely, it was a deeply racist piece of crap. He said absolutely and under no circumstances. So Branch just kind of held that in his back pocket and waited and bided his time. And when Landis died in 44 or 45, it was the next year when Branch finally made his move and, and signed Jackie Robinson. And it came out of that deep faith. It came out of that, that deep respect of understanding of the equality of the races. And just, and, and like I said, he was a big cigar guy. I have so many pictures of him with cigars that it's just, and in fact, the, the, when, when he signed Jackie, he had a cigar in his hand in, in a lot of those pictures. And so... Branch Rickey is, is my number one by far. Number two is Mark Twain. There is something just absolutely magical about reading him, about reading his quotes, about listening to his humor. He is just, he was not, a, I mean, the church of the, ni- of the late 1800s, early 1900s turned him off to Christianity. But I really wonder what he would think about Christianity if he were to sit in here with, at a Holy Smokes mm. with us and just hear our conversations. And just see the way in which we love each other. And we love, I I really think his opinion of God and his opinion of of who we are as a group would start to soften that heart. And he has so many great quotes about, you know, Congress and just, oh, the the guy's unbelievable. And And the third one? And he'd be a riot. So when I interviewed you, you said your third was the Inklings. So it was a group of people. Yes. So you're going you know, you to pick a group. My, my group is small. It's only two. Okay. And it's my brothers. Oh. My brothers. My awesome. brother, Ryan, my little brother, Ryan, who was six foot ten. He's a member of the Holy Smokes group. He, we, we had a couple of cigars in, uh, three cigars in, awesome. in Australia. And uh, yeah, so Ryan is almost as big of a Branch Ricky fan as I am. And in fact, this, this is really cool. So his wife has a cousin who is the great, great grand nephew of Branch Rickey. And oh his goodness. name is Branch Rickey. Oh my gosh. And so, and so I, I have a connection. I, I have an idea of doing a documentary series or a, a podcast documentary series about Branch Rickey, where I interview the historians that have written about him. I interview family members. I've got a direct connection that would now be with so the cool. family. And, yeah, I can't and wait so, to see that. So, he, he's, so yeah, so Ryan is one and then my brother Neil. And Neil, Neil, Neil would really, his, his humor is very similar to Mark Twain. And so the two of them would just, would just be a riot to see them go That would back be pretty forth. cool. Okay, the final question. Steve, in a year from now, and we're going to have a bottle of chilled champagne, which Matt Hurd will probably pick out for us, <laughs> which you'll be hearing from him in a future podcast. Very soon. Very soon. What would we be celebrating? What would you like to envision that we would be celebrating? We are celebrating that this church podcast course has launched and brought in enough money that I can start to really pursue some of those more expensive, cutting-edge medical treatments for my wife that I can't afford right now. We didn't get into it. We'll get into it at a future episode where we start to talk about well, I've got a couple of people that have gone through six yeah. spouses and, and dealing with that because one of the beautiful things about Holy Smokes is when I got involved, that's when my wife really got sick. Yeah. And it was the guys that came around me that told me they were praying for me and brought by meals that really made an impact. Um, in 2014, my wife was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. She had de- dealt with autoimmune stuff throughout her whole marriage. But um, she had always complained about tightness in her chest that the doctors always said, oh, that's just the lupus. That's just the lupus. That's just the lupus. But it, she had a lupus flare up in early 2014 that she got better from so quickly that the pulmonary hypertension raged. And her heart went from perfect in March of 2014 to November, was significantly enlarged and failing congestively. Spent uh, 
let's see, she spent probably, I'd say about four weeks at CU Denver, uh, trying to get better. And, um, so anyway, that, that's something that we've been dealing with. She's on some medicine that, uh, is doing exactly what the doctor said. It would eventually start to wear, start to be less effective. And so this year they had to increase the meds and it's eventually going to get to a point where her body's going to not respond to that. And so I'm praying that uh, some kind of, uh, new technology, new treatment, new medicine, new whatever, uh, comes around and really helps to, uh, get her healthy again, get that heart and lungs, because the only hope that we have of her coming out of this right now is a lung transplant, which is still a major, 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 major surgery. Yeah. That has a very high uh, mortality rate and complication rate. And so I really want to avoid that because for every person that we've seen that she has seen, or we've heard of, that has made it through that surgery. We've heard of one, maybe two that have gone through massive complications or didn't survive. And so, so there, there, there are lots of things coming that I'd like to try, like uh, stem cell therapy. There's a stem cell clinic in Dallas. Unfortunately, that's $35,000. There's a stem cell clinic that, uh, that uh, Bell Gibson took his dad on his deathbed at 92 years old. And uh, his dad turned around so quickly that 10 years later, now his dad's still alive and kicking. Um, so uh, th- there's some conflicting studies right now on whether that's effective for pulmonary hypertension. Uh, but at the point at which it looks like it's something to pursue, I want to be able to pursue that. I want to be able to pursue you know, getting her in front of some of the best functional medicine doctors in the, in the country and uh, mm. trying to, you know, fine tune our diet. We've done a great job in cleaning up our diet, but I want to, I want to see this church course explode to where if, if indeed it is, you know, stem cell therapy that I can drop $35,000 and, you know, go to Dallas or go to Panama. And let's be able to pop open a second bottle of champagne on her healing. Oh yeah. Without question. Yeah. 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 It's, it's one of those things where I'm, I, I have hope for one of three things to happen. One, that modern medicine just comes up with the right therapy, the right treatment, whatever, and gets it, gets it done. Two, we find that alternative treatment that's not quite approved by Western medicine, but it proves to be effective and takes care of it. Or number three is that, uh, you know, she's just miraculously healed. I'm holding out for one of those three things. Good. So. Steve Ryder, host of the Holy Smokes podcast and so many others like to thank you so much for being our friend, being a Sherpa in this <laughs> journey that we're having as Holy Smokes podcast evolves and grows and we get to hear other stories. And you are truly a master storyteller. And, and I pray that uh, God will just continue to bless you and prosper you. And then also bring healing to your wife, especially. And that uh, we're all enriched by the friendship that we have with you. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Kay, for inviting me to this group because... This has been absolutely